Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Inside the Fairbanks. Um, today we are going to be uh, talking about a couple of William Balch's habitat groupings again, like we did a few weeks ago. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the moose, which you can see behind me, and uh, the bison today, and uh, a couple of uh, issues uh, that um, relate to them. Uh, so, um, welcome and let's get started. So here we can see the uh, moose habitat grouping um, that um, William Balch uh, made in 1898. Um, there are a few interesting uh, things about this um, habitat grouping. One is that it did not used to be in the, uh, originally in this case. Um, it was put into this case in uh, 1907 and um, to enclose it. Originally it had this, did still have this base that you can see, um, but it had just a railing, a short railing, maybe a foot high around it. And um, <clears throat> also he, um, Balch, made a lot of these flowers and trees himself. Some are um, actual pieces of trees or plants, like the trunk of this white birch back here, um, <clears throat> uh, but actually he made all these leaves here himself um, using wax and cloth. And um, so, um, yeah, we'll uh, head down to the uh, bison and we'll learn more about the moose in just a minute. <clears throat> Down here we have the bison, which um, Balch made this habitat grouping in um, 1902 and um, for the museum, and the moose was made for the museum as well. Uh, this also was not originally in a, uh, uh, this case. Um, again, it had the base that you can see down here with the short railing around it. And um, this has uh, a, pretty big animal, as is the moose, and um, these, both of these animals were uh, in trouble um, in the, um, you know, the species were in trouble in the early 1900s and late 1800s for uh, a variety of reasons, including hunting and um, clear cutting for farms, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the second part of the video. And you can see this is a little bit simpler um, diorama, um, but um, still pretty impressive, um, largely because of the animal uh, itself, but um, also the fact that it's been here for um, over 100 years on display continuously, as has the, the moose um, down at the other end. So um, we'll um, start in the second part of the, vi the video, we'll start looking at some of the um, other interesting facts about these animals and the, and the groupings. Okay, everyone, uh, we're now going to uh, delve into a little bit of the history behind these two habitat groupings and then some of the um, natural history and uh, conservation issues uh, related to these two species, the moose and the bison. Um, the American bison. So um, let me share my screen with you. Um, so um, <clears throat> you may have heard, uh, um, noted that I call these habitat groupings instead of dioramas as they're usually called. Um, that is uh, technically what these are. Um, in order for them to be dioramas, they would have to have a, a background image or painting of some kind, uh, which helped give the full effect of uh, depth and um, uh, you know, being in the habitat with these animals. But so technically these are habitat groupings as all of our larger dioramas are. Um, and of course the benefit of uh, Diorama is that you get that effect of the uh, being in the habitat with the animals, but the benefit of what we have at, at the Fairbanks Museum is 
that you can walk all the way around these and see the animals themselves from um, different, all different sides, um, which you often cannot with um, dioramas. Um, and that's certainly the, um, yeah, a great benefit of what we have here. And uh, the moose diorama uh, habitat grouping that we have, um, we just a few years ago uh, removed a case from the um, east side, uh, which is towards the back of the museum of that case. So now you can go on three sides of it again, instead of just uh, the two. Um, so you get the um, greater view of, of it. And as I mentioned before, uh, these two um, um, groupings um, uh, were not originally in cases. And you can see here uh, these two images from our archives. These were um, scanned from glass plates uh, that are in the museum's archives, uh, showing the railing that um, was used to be around them um, instead of the case cases that they're in now. And it uh, looks like they're about two feet tall off the, the, the pedestals instead of about one like I one foot like I said before. Um, and then they were put into their cases again in 1907. Uh, the moose has been in um, its case that's in now since since then um, with some of the glass replaced, the original glass replaced um, with safety glass for um, obviously safety reasons because they and um, the moose as well, or the bison as well, sorry, um, because of safety concerns. They were just large plate glass uh, pieces before, which um, were obviously um, breakable and would go into uh, lots and lots of pieces and be very sharp um, if they broke. Um, and the, the bison was also put into a case in 1907, but um, was removed uh, for a little while and uh, then re-cased um, in uh, the early 1990s using a lot of the same parts um, to, of the original case to create the new case. Um, so uh, now uh, moving on to, um, so these are examples of um, dioramas from the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, they're placed in and moose dioramas um, showing the backgrounds that were painted there. Um, so now going into uh, the creation of um, these uh, moose um, grouping. Uh, the, moose, the moose that we have in there was shot in uh, 1897 by William Balch, who created all the, our large um, habitat groupings. And this, these two um, images are uh, clipped out of a, le a letter um, from uh, digitally clipped, <laughs> not physically clipped out, but um, from a letter that um, a ball sent to a friend um, describing the, his trip a little bit and the moose. Um, you can see he says he, it was in Nova Scotia and it was in 1897 that he shot the moose. Um, he says it stood eight feet or six feet eight inches high at the shoulder, which was quite tall for a, an eastern moose and uh, about a thousand pounds or over a thousand pounds. Um, and the antlers had a spread of 48 inches. Um, and so it was a, quite a large moose for an Eastern moose. Um, and I'll talk a little, in a little bit about why he had to go to Nova Scotia to find one. Um, and uh, you can see, um, it wasn't until 1898 that he actually created the, um, this habitat group um, for the museum. And you can see here, um, he had a lot of work from a the hunting season that had just closed um, in uh, Vermont. So he was very busy, which uh, shows the quality, or is an illustrative of his quality of his work, uh, which you can also see in all of his work that we have at the Fairbanks Museum. He was a very talented taxidermist and artist. Um, and Franklin Fairbanks was lucky to find him and have him doing a lot of the taxidermy for the museum um, up until his death in eight, uh, 1919. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the bison um, was, uh, that we have, um, the specimen was living in the Corbin Wildlife Park in Newport, New Hampshire um, when it died in 1902. 
Um, although I've heard that he actually died before that and Balch kept the skin for a, a couple of years before he actually got around to uh, making the grouping. Um, but it uh, was not that far from St. Johnsbury. And we know that Balch traveled to the West in um, the 1870s. And um, I was, um, wonder if he didn't see some bison there and um, take an interest in them and jumped at the opportunity to um, create this um, bison grouping for, for the museum when he had the opportunity in um, 1902 to do that. Um, and it was installed in December of uh, 1892, or sorry, 1902, um, this bison was. Um, and uh, one thing that amazes me with all these groupings, they're all now over 100 years old and they've been on display since they were installed. Um, and it's amazing to me that um, condition they're in, the good condition that they're in because um, and part of that is because they were put into cases and um, preserved uh, very well. Um, but still, they've been around a long time and are in very good shape because of it. So um, moving on to uh, some of the conservation issues, um, starting with the moose. Um, this is the uh, moose are the largest living members of the, uh, the deer family. You can see a comparison here with size comparison with some other members of the uh, deer family, elk, caribou, and deer. Um, and of course, there are different species of deer that vary somewhat in size. Um, and eastern moose can be uh, over six feet uh, at the shoulder and weigh over, uh, well over a thousand pounds. Um, and although there are other species, subspecies around the world. Um, and you can see here are range maps. That, um, they're found in northern regions uh, in the boreal forests, primarily um, around the northern latitudes of, um, of the world. And here is more specifically um, North America. And you can see the Alaskan moose range here, uh, which is one of the largest moose species, uh, subspecies. Um, and in Vermont, one of the issues in the past with um, moose was that um, in New England, especially, there was a lot of deforestation for um, uh, ranching with sheep and farming. So it was about 80% forested in um, when the Europeans arrived. And by 1850, uh, there was uh, three quarters or so of that was re removed. So there's only about 20% forestation and moose really and other um, animals like deer and um, but especially bears and turkeys and um, others uh, really need the forest to survive. So they were um, pretty much gone from Vermont in the late 1800s and well into the 1900s. And uh, that's um, part of the reason why Balch had to go to Nova Scotia to shoot the moose that we have. And um, also in 1896, the year before he went um, on his little trip, uh, Vermont had put a ban on hunting moose in, a, in an effort to protect them. And um, of course, uh, after the Civil War, a lot of farmers uh, started moving west uh, to, um, uh, for the land opportunities there and um, the forest started to come back and with that um, some of these animals that had left started coming back as well and moose were one of the last ones to do that. Their numbers peaked at about 5,000 in the early 2000s and um, which was really a, a few too many and um, they have since been reduced in number um, with hunting and uh, um, other means. And part of the, some of the new challenges for moose are climate change. Um, and that's largely because moose are very well adapted to colder climates uh, with um, highly insulated fur and thick skin and a low surface to volume ratio. Um, so when the temperatures start to rise, they become very, um, lethargic and um, 
challenged. <clears throat> so um, as the climate continues to warm, uh, assuming we don't um, you know, change our ways and uh, um, start trying to um, help the environment, the climate um, moose uh, may very well disappear from northern New England again. And also, uh, there are uh, also connected to climate change parasites, uh, including ticks, are becoming a large issue for uh, moose. Uh, they can have tens of thousands of them per moose, um, which is very itchy for them. So they rub up against trees and trying to get them off, but in the process, lose hair uh, in the winter, and which is obviously not very good when they're trying to keep warm. And so they can expend more energy and become weak, and um, some are dying because of that. So the numbers are around um, 2,200 now in Vermont, um, which is actually a little bit lower than what I've read that um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife would like their numbers to be. Um, so even though there are more moose in Vermont than there were 100 years ago, by quite a bit, uh, but by quite a few, um, they are having new challenges which are reducing their numbers. And if the trends continue, they could again be um, not found in, in this area. So moving on to bison, um, there are actually um, two different uh, species of bison uh, remaining um, in existence, uh, the uh, American bison and the European bison. You can see a little comparison of them here. Um, and uh, again, here with these two, and then uh, there are three ex extinct uh, species of bison illustrated here, which um, as you can see, were much larger. Um, <clears throat> and in with the uh, American bison, there are two subspecies, the, the wood bison and the plains bison. Um, and, um, some clear, clear differences, a larger hump here and larger overall and heavier, um, some other differences. <clears throat> and then, um, so getting into some of their uh, conservation issues, uh, historically you can see they had a, quite a large range, um, not just out in the plains and in the west, like a lot of people I think think these days, it went well into the east, uh, including up into New York and um, Georgia and northern Florida, as well as down into Mexico and over into California. <clears throat> um, and um, at, at the time when they had their greatest range, there were between 30 and 60 million bison uh, ranging around, and they were a very important uh, uh, food source for the Native Americans. Um, and um, of course, they, for the early Europeans who were here, they were a food source, but then when conflicts started happening, uh, one way that Europeans were trying to, um, you know, uh, control the uh, Native Americans was by controlling their food sources, so they were hunting the bison, and also uh, they wanted the skins and um, tongues for food. Uh, so the uh, mass hunting began in the 1830s and um, at the height of um, European hunting, there were um, hundreds of thousands and even up to over a million uh, killed every year. And by 1884, there were, or the 1880s, there were um, well under a thousand wild bison uh, left in the, in the world, um, including only about 25 in Yellowstone. And um, <clears throat> so, um, but now the, their numbers have come back quite a bit. Um, there are about uh, 31,000 wild bison um, in, and, uh, in several areas. You can see in this map on the right, uh, these green areas uh, show where the wild bison are. Um, and uh, th there are, um, hundreds of thousands in um, captive herds for uh, for meat, and um, so there are a lot around, relatively, although still under uh, under a million, well under a million, um, and which is uh, 
So there are a lot fewer than there were historically when there were tens of millions. Um, and also there are concerns going forward. Um, one of the concerns with bison for the long-term viability of them is the genetics. Um, there have been, uh, there's been interbreeding with um, cattle over the years um, with the uh, free range, uh, you know, large ranging cattle operations out in the West and um, Different, I've seen different numbers about the percentage of bison with cattle genes, um, upwards of 90% of private bison herds having um, nine, uh, cattle DNA in them. So uh, also um, selecting for uh, <clears throat> better captive um, herds, so uh, reducing further the genetic diversity and um, also, um, there are only about, I've read that there are only about 15,000 pure uh, bison uh, animals in the wild, um, which uh, is a relatively small number. And uh, of course, genetic diversity and is uh, very important for uh, a healthy population of any animal. And it depends on, um, it varies from animal to uh, species to species what that number is, but um, that is a, this is a, a pretty big concern for bison um, going forward. Um, but um, we'll see, um, I guess, with both of these, what uh, different conservation efforts uh, bring about. And um, uh, hopefully we are able to um, uh, continue having these um, magnificent animals around for many years to come. So uh, that about wraps it up for this week's Inside the Fairbanks. Um, thanks again for joining us. And of course, as always, let us know if you have questions and we'll do our best to